Hey, good morning, good evening. Uh, welcome to Oracle Groundbreaker Yata 2020 online webinar series. I'm sure all are uh, super excited to learn and expand your network. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, users group webinar series covering 14 days, um, 125 plus hours of learning. And you can see 100 plus sessions, 100 plus speakers. And this is the first time we got like 60 plus Oracle Ace communities and Java champions. So, so please uh, join all next 14 days. Next slide is, uh, is today's, uh, so every day we are hosting around eight sessions starting from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And in between you have coffee, tea, and lunch and dinner breaks. And unfortunately we are not serving, but you can take uh, coffee, tea breaks. Um, always uh, refer our website for accurate timings, okay? Uh, this is today's speakers. We have great speakers or in race to share their knowledge. Uh, before uh, handing over to Sandesh, right? I just want to spend one minute on this slide. Um, this is uh, AIOUG, All India Oracle Users Group, started in 2007, um, almost 13 years of serving Oracle community in many different ways, largely running uh, knowledge sharing sessions. Um, especially we run face-to-face -face events are very popular and due to COVID-19, we are not doing it, but uh, still I think uh, people are joining our uh, Wednesday webinars regularly. I think we get almost a hundred plus people regularly. Uh, so use this platform and build your network, share your knowledge with community. And you can also see Sangam is our annual conference uh, started in Bangalore, 2019. Then we hosted in Hyderabad. Uh, then onwards, we are hosting these uh, two cities alternatively. Uh, the history behind uh, Oracle Groundbreaker Yatra. Um, so then what about other cities, right? So we started Yatra taking uh, key speakers joining major cities in India, started in 2013, and this is the eighth year. Uh, it is it, it was always fun to travel, especially with, uh, you know, speakers like Sandesh um, is like, uh, we call him as a selfie master. I don't know how he is going to do it today. Uh, we are going to miss all the face-to-face -face, uh, networking this year, but the positive side of this year is uh, Yatra is uh, we are we are bringing more speakers, and more speakers are coming across the globe virtually, right? Uh, so use our website. Uh, you can find single portal for all the sets. Uh, we are working on networking platform like uh, Facebook Workplace. Uh, we will announce very soon. And this is very very beautiful team. Um, so especially I need to thank a couple of them. They're working for night and day, and I think we are sleeping only four hours. And it, this is like more painful <laughs> to host virtually. The physical events are very easy for us. And so I'll just keep the slide for 30 seconds. Uh, you know, this is the way you start uh, connecting people, take a screenshot or snippet and post it in Twitter. And you'll come to know there are like uh, 700 people joining this webinar. Uh, this is the only way you can connect people in the Twitter because you are not seeing face to face, right? So we are encouraging you to do Twitter, tweet uh, throughout this throughout the session. And this is very important. I'm attending this one so that other people also can join. And this is a free webinar, right? <clears throat> so now here are the rock star, um, Sandesh Rao, uh, Vice President running AI ops automation for the autonomous database group at Oracle Corporation. Uh, he's a specialist in AI ML and uh, he's uh, our Rockstock speaker. Um, he basically spent previous positions have uh, basically focusing on performance tuning, high availability, uh, disaster recovery. Ask anything, by the way, I don't want to read any technologies here. Uh, he's having more than 18 years of experience and uh, Initially, I know Sandesh is a rack guru. <laughs> now he's also switching uh, the technologies. Now he's a uh, master in AI and the machine learning. Ask anything. And you know you can ask him after the after this session also via Twitter, right? So with that, I'm handing over to our rock star, Sandesh Rao. Thanks, Sandesh, for all your support towards AI OUG. Well, thanks a lot, Sai. Hang on, give me a second. Let me just share my screen. Uh, 
Uh, let me just put this to slide mode. All right, I'm assuming you can see this. Sai, is this good? Hang on, let me move this here. All yeah, right. It's Sweet. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, first of all, uh, I hope everybody is doing okay because you know this is we are in PC or pre uh, post COVID times where uh, everyone is stuck at home. Uh, Unlock 2.0 is in progress. Uh, you know, India and the US are competing for who's having the highest cases. I see some of the uh, India aces trying to predict how many cases are going to be there over a time using machine learning. Uh, these are these are extremely unprecedented times. Uh, the thing that I'm glad about is we have the opportunity to uh, share all this knowledge. And obviously, uh, thanks to the team without which this would not happen. So one of the reasons I put a couple of these slides here is because I totally missed this event. Uh, you know, it's an online, it's 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 more of an in-person event. And you know me, I'm I'm a person who talks to everybody. You know, I hug everybody, shake hands, take selfies with everybody. So for me, this is like a very strange way to uh, conduct this event. But at the same time, I'm trying to do the best and trying to give you as much knowledge as you can. So take advantage of all the stuff you're going to get in the next couple of days. And obviously, thank you to all the volunteers who have spent as much time. Uh, I know people are going crazy with time zones out here. But uh, this is these are the volunteers. These are some of the crazy things uh, I think we've done over the last couple of years. Uh, it's been singing, there's been dancing, there's been uh, putting hands up and down, and there's uh, Connor talking about uh, uh, quizzes, and uh, there's been prizes. And as you can see, this is an extremely vibrant community. And I totally miss the songs and the dancing part over here. And obviously, as you can see, I'm the selfie guy. Uh, I don't know if I can do any selfies today because it's like, you know, selfies with Zoom totally suck. Uh, I would rather say that the next time we physically meet, we'll probably make up for it. Uh, that's that's the only thing I can say about the selfie aspect of it. But one thing I'll tell you guys is uh, stay safe. Uh, Unlock 2.0 is in progress, but you know there's going to be all these lockdown measures. Uh, try to uh, you know try to stay indoors, and uh, you got 15 days now of excuses to sit in front of your computer and learn a whole bunch of new stuff. All right, with that we'll just get started. So my today's presentation is going to be focused on the role of the autonomous DBA. So what are the various things on the autonomous cloud the DBA can do? Uh, I've made a list of a couple of things we'll go through today. These are some of the most common questions that I get that people keep asking, saying, how can I do this? How can I do that? As a, as a DBA, I'm an on-prem DBA. Now I'm working on autonomous. What are the things in autonomous that I can or cannot do? Uh, obviously, I have a lot more points than this, and but we only have uh, 45 minutes. So I'm trying to condense the whole thing with that. So with this, we'll get started. So first thing is, what is the role of the autonomous DBA? Right? So traditionally, most DBAs are responsible for you know, architecture planning, modeling, data security. But at the same time, they also configure, they tune their systems, they configure the networks, they configure the storage, they do database provisioning, patching, backups, HA, uh, setting up rack clusters, as well as any other kind of database optimization. Uh, with autonomous, a whole bunch of stuff basically at the bottom goes away because all this stuff is actually managed within our environments, and we have exadators, we patch our exadators. Uh, all the databases are automatically patched. Uh, there's backups that are automatically created. Uh, you can actually create your own new backups, but there's automatic backups. There's automated disaster recovery failover across multiple regions. And you know, most of the stuff that we know as DBAs uh, are, are basically uh, you know, changing in the autonomous space. But, the aspects above in the in the top part. So, by the way, uh, before I go ahead, uh, you know, because we we you know this whole every time we do this on Zoom and people are like asking questions and stuff like that, and we mute and unmute people, a lot of confusion happens. If you have any questions through the whole course of this presentation, type it into chat. We will cover the questions at the end. So, as I'm explaining, if you have questions, type them into the chat, please. All right. So, these aspects of architecture planning, modeling, and all are still pretty hot. Uh, there are four aspects of this uh, that we focus on. So first thing is uh, the, uh, the data engineer who's responsible for taking all this information and massage it and make it available to the, the citizen data scientists. That's one role. Data security classification, data lifecycle management is another role. Uh, machine learning, a person who's actually doing the machine learning, doing insights and predictions is another role, as well as SQL tuning, connection management, uh, uh, you know, authentication authorization, 
uh, loading data into the database, migrating data from on-prem to cloud, that's another role. So these are all, these are four high level classifications of the roles that are currently present. Uh, also, another thing that's happened from a DBA perspective is people used to do reports and dashboards, then they went to diagnostic reports, and then things went to predictive or machine learning reports, which basically meaning what's going to happen and when will it happen, and then basically going to complete ML-enabled apps. So the apps are also moving from just plain data and information to basically apps with machine learning and insight, right? Uh, another interesting thing is, as DBAs, we've never, you know, we've never spent too much time thinking about this, but business use cases. I have a site that you know. I have a site that is trying to sell insurance to customers. I want to find out which are my best customers. I want to sell goods. You know, I'm a Flipkart. I want to find out which customers go away if I if I don't have a discount. Uh, I have a payment system. You know, I'm a Paytm. I want to find out uh, you know which areas the maximum number of fraud happens. Who are my best customers? Who are the customers who will buy no matter what happens if I if I give them a discount or not? I can send them promotional emails. So these are. The most important thing for a DBA today is to understand the business and use cases. So there's been a shift in terms of uh, not just like looking at you know, you know installing, patching, adding table spaces and stuff like that, but also understanding what is the best way to unlock the data that I have inside my database that I can actually make this available for my business. So the DBA's role is shifting in this direction in doing more of this. So. How do you get started with this whole thing? So you, everybody knows that the autonomous database has a free tier. It's called the always free services. I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about this because some people still don't use it or still don't know how to get to it. So by, with this, you basically get access to compute VMs, block storage, as well as uh, two autonomous databases that you can create, uh, 10 gigs of object and archive storage, about 50,000 API requests a month, and about 500 million ingestion data points. So these are, these are just some of the stats you get with the free instances. You never have to pay any money for it. And you can use this to practice and do a whole bunch of other stuff. If you want to create any of these databases, there's an option to create either an ATP or an ADW database. And once you create this, you always select this always free option. Again, if you have questions, please type them in the chat. We will cover them towards the end of the presentation. So that way, it allows me to keep a flow in the presentation at the same time you know, you can understand most of these aspects without me being constantly interrupted in and out with questions. Thank you. So here's an always, so you always have to select this always free option. So which means anything that's basically available to paid users is not going to be shown to you as a user. The next aspect is as a DBA, what are the various kinds of things that I can do here? Okay, or what are the roles that I will do? There's probably a list of about 100 plus items that, as a DBA that you can do, and I'm covering the first 10 or so today. First of all, every one of these instances has wallets for authentication and authorization. These wallets are basically either per instance or they're called regional wallets. Now, instance wallets, each and every, uh, each and every specific database instance will have its own wallet. And then post rotation, these wallets will need to be re-downloaded, as well as all the regional wallets uh, with all the database certification keys will continue to work. So the, the regional wallets can actually supersede the database wallets. If the wallet is rotated, then all the user sessions for that database is terminated. So why do we need all these wallets, right? So a wallet is a way, basically when, you're, when, you, when you connect to a database, there's an option called DB connection. Most people who are familiar with the autonomous database know this download wallet option. Now there's this rotate wallet option where you wanna change the credentials every, every say couple of months, you know, whatever your uh, your uh, security policy may dictate. So once you have this rotate, uh, rotate wallet option, everybody who is connecting to this database instance will be forced to download the latest wallet. So you can see the rotation is in progress. But once the rotation is complete, you'll have to see these log messages. So one thing I want to mention here, every action you perform in the autonomous database, there's this thing called log messages. It's actually at the bottom uh, bottom left of the screen for every one of these actions. When you click on log messages, you can basically see all the information about whatever action that's currently going on, database creation, uh, standby creation, backup creation, uh, changing and rotating database wallets. You can actually see the log messages, you can see the error messages and the associated resources with it. So this is a genetic screen that you can see with every action that you're basically doing. The next one you can do, so that is wallets. So which means you rotate your wallet, 
you re-download the new wallets, and then people can use their existing credentials with the new wallets to connect to the database instances. So this is a security feature that allows you to swap wallets, which basically contain the certificates uh, uh, that are the, the, the certificates uh, uh, that are required to connect to the database using SQL Developer. The second thing the DBA can do is basically creating partitions with external tables in cloud. Now, a lot of times we've done this in on-prem instances where you can use partitioning and you can use partition pruning, partition maintenance. And obviously partitioning is one of the most core options that you can use as part of any database, whether you're using this on-prem. Now, in case of the autonomous database, uh, you can use partitioning using uh, the existing files you have, but at the same time, you can also use files that are located in the object store. Now, the object store is this infinitely scalable storage that you have where you can store gobs and gobs of data, and you can basically access this in an extremely scalable fashion with hardly any stuff that you have to do. Uh, there's this thing it's called the PAR bucket or the pre-authenticated request bucket. So when you're creating an object store, you create this link, it's called a PAR link. Once you create a PAR link and you have authorized your user to use this PAR link, you see this link, it's called the HTTPS Swift Object Storage, blah, blah, blah. I've cut the URL for the purposes of brevity, but you have to give the complete URL out there where the corresponding file is located. So in this case, I'm creating a partition table with comma delimiters, with new lines and US7 ASCII types, and the columns that are extracted, basically the, first, the they're split into three partitions uh, for call one greater than 1,000, 2,000, and 3,000. And these are basically coming from files that are located on the object store. So a simple statement like this, where you define your credentials, which is part of the credential name, as you can see in def cred name, and then you define these par, par request buckets, which are basically access to the object store, and you can load data into the autonomous database using DBMS Cloud. I have a couple of other examples ahead, but this is a very simple example of how you can have partitions with external uh, tables support in, uh, that's running off the object store. The next one here is you can actually have partial indexing or partial storage where some data basically sits on the object store and some data sits on the DB partition. This is also a very popular option. So when you're doing this, your data can basically be sitting in any object store, whether it is Oracle Object Store, S3, or Azure. And then it's, it's, it's not a new feature, but it's a very cool way of exchanging data and not having to copy data to your, uh, to your instance or your DBFS table space that's enabled for you. Instead, you can just use pre-authenticated or explicit authenticated URLs. So here's an example of how you can actually load this. So if you notice the last partition, partition P3, there is no external location clause. So which means the first two locations are basically loading data from an external object store. And the last one is basically loading data from the database itself, or it's loading data into a partition that's located inside your database itself for autonomous. So this is a pretty cool feature and a lot of partitioning and partition pruning, as well as uh, ILM-based lifecycle management work in this case, using the object store and a combination of what you have within the autonomous database is something a DBA could be doing. The third one, performance tuning and monitoring. So it's like, you know, so a lot of times I've come across people who say, but you're auto-tuning everything. So what, what am I going to do here? Uh, there's a certain amount of auto-tuning that's actually built into the database itself. Uh, but at the same time, there's a certain amount of metrics that are accessible that allow the DBA to do a couple of things. So first of all, you can monitor all the health and capacity performance that is available in your ADB instances. Metrics, alarms, notifications, all of this can be set. Now, by default, there are these service metrics that are exposed as part of your autonomous database instance. Now, there are a couple of these which are available as service metrics. CPU utilization, memory utilization, failed connections, execution counts, queues, failed logons, user calls, parse. As a DBA, we have seen all of this all the time. These metrics are available as service metrics by default as part of the autonomous database. But then these are a lot of metrics and I don't wanna see a lot of metrics. By default, the autonomous database screens will show you the top six view of these service metrics. Now these six, these six views are more than adequate for you to figure out what is really happening inside the autonomous database. From a CPU utilization, storage utilization, sessions, session counts, how many statements are queued, because remember, you're actually running this whole thing in a resource manager fashion with multiple session, with multiple service names that are basically tracking the 
SLA performance of these connections that are coming into the database instance. So by default, only the, these top six metrics are exposed as part of the ADB console. You can actually add to these, or you can also create alarms on these. So first thing here is, this complete set of metrics is available via the OCI console. And there's an option here called service metrics, and you can basically use these service metrics by using the monitoring API. So how do you set alarms on this? One of the most common things for me as a DBA was, hey, if, if I have a session that's running like say higher than 100% uh, utilization, a box that's running more than 100% utilization for five minutes, I want a notification to be set up. Today we set up cron jobs, DBMS scheduler jobs, uh, custom scripts, Ansible scripts. There's so many different ways of doing this, but there's a built-in thing in service metrics where you can actually configure this. Specify the compartment, specify the metric, in this case, it's the OCI autonomous database on the right side. And then afterwards, once you specify this, it pops the details. And then you can say, I want to create an alarm on this particular query for CPU utilization. Then I get a screen. Now, the screen looks like it has a lot of fields, but it's not complicated at all. Remember, you're setting this up once, and then it basically tracks this for this autonomous database for the life of this metric in its existence. And it will send you these messages every time this metric is violated. So you go to alarm definitions, you create an alarm, you specify the details, you specify whether you want it to be critical, warning, et cetera, and then you specify uh, what is this alarm mean, a tag that is associated with this, and then you go into the actual metric that you're trying to pull, what interval you want this thing, and you want to calculate the mean per minute, and then you also specify the metric dimension, what are you going to do with this thing, and then if it's greater than 55%, and if the delay is greater than a minute, that means if the CPU, this is just a test condition, remember this, it's, it may not reflect anybody's real world conditions, but this is a good, it's a good test to understand how this works. So it's greater than 55% of value for uh, a minute. And then it basically tells you over this time, that's the metric that's been set. Now, if you notice, there's a red dash line. The red dash line is where the metric is triggered, which is where the mean is. And then the blue line, which is after 11.30 going forward, is the actual CPU utilization that is present. The last aspect is the notification, where you can basically send notifications to Slack, to PagerDuty, to email. There are several different methods of doing this. Once you select that and complete it, the alarm is created. And then afterwards, anything that happens on this instance, the alarm will notify you, depending on what you have specified as part of this thing. So as a DBA, you have like a, like a mini enterprise manager with some basic functionality that's completely built up as part of the autonomous database that you can set up alerts and you can do all sorts of interesting performance tuning activities. There's an alarm status console that basically shows you all the alarms and when are they firing for your components and stuff like that. So this shows you all the alarms for your specific compartment that you have created. So I showed you an example of how to create an alarm and how to see where these alarms are located. Next one, DBAs love performance tuning, but they don't have access to most of the stuff that's underneath. So how do I see this? What sort of metrics can I see? Can I kill sessions? Can I change your priorities? You can do everything you can do in a typical on-prem environment, except have access to the underlying file system in your database. Uh, you can go here to Performance Hub, and in Performance Hub, you can see everything that you've been seeing over all these years. Now, I'll cover a couple of aspects here. So first is, the performance hub shows you the average active sessions and the most important metrics that you have to track, which is CPU, user IO, and anything that's going on in percentage weight, as well as what your maximum CPU utilization has been over the last duration that has actually been shown out here. So that's the first thing to look at, right? It's just to get an idea of how your autonomous database is performing. So there's a time range selector. By default, the last 60 minutes is selected, but you can specify views, last eight hours, last 24 hours, last week, custom ranges, as well as you can drill down broken by CPU, user, user IO, as well as weight. A new thing that's been added recently is a time zone selector. So you can basically change a time zone selector and say, what time zone are you actually looking at? So hence it's reflected in the time zone. This was, a, this was something that a lot of people were asking because even though you may be say, you know, say you're, for example, you know, you're working out of India, but your client is in the Frankfurt region, you want to change it to your browser time zone so you can actually see and monitor the sessions and troubleshoot this in the time zone of your choice. So this is a time zone selector that's been actually added 
to Performance Hub that will allow you to troubleshoot and do things within your browser. What are the other performance things can I can do? So first of all, you can look up SQLs. You can look up user sessions. Uh, you can do Ash Analytics. Now, the interesting thing about everybody knows what Ash Analytics is. And the interesting thing that this thing allows you to do is it graphically breaks down. And there's, there's a couple of things you need to know. Any SQL that has a spinning icon means it's running. Anything that's green means it's all okay or the SQL has completed. Anything that's a red cross means something is wrong or it's not working. And anything that has a clock means it's waiting to be queued. Now remember, each and every one of these services is associated with a specific degree of parallelism. Some of them allow parallelism, some of them do not allow parallelism at all. So if a query is blocked because of not having parallelism, it will have a clock icon associated with it. And that indicates the SQL is being queued. Now, I don't want to go through all of these screens, but I have actually kept them in my presentation. So when you're actually downloading this, you can see what are the various screens you have. I would strongly encourage you to log in into your own instance and play around with this. But you have the ability to look at any of these dimensions from weight classes or top dimensions, SQL, PL SQL, session identifiers, attributes. Each and every one of these is a detailed drill down into this. But there's another option here. So you can see this one where you can also switch over to this view for Ash Analytics, where you can see two different things. Everything, all the average active sessions here are sorted by weight class and weight event. Now, I, if you notice here, there's a couple of things you can do with this screen. So first of all, you can switch to the advanced mode and then you can actually change dimensions or you can change sample sizes to see how it changes your perspective of how you're actually looking at these weight events. Here's an example where, let me go back to the previous slide and show you the difference. This one is active sessions by weight class and weight events. So you can see weight class, weight events, different colors for different events, two dimensions. When you switch to three dimensions, it's added SQL ID as well. So I'm actually seeing CPU, CPU plus weight for CPU and the SQL IDs within that particular CPU. So I'm seeing three dimensions within a single screen and I can drill down right here to see which of these SQLs and what they're basically doing. So this is what it allows you to do. Just within a couple of simple clicks, this UI is not intended to be complicated. It is, it is just intended to give you the performance hub at the top, which tells you what's happening at a high level on the system and the Ash analytics at the bottom that allows you to group things based on weight class, weight events, SQL ID. And these are three dimensions and it's organized these sessions based on these weight classes and SQL IDs. And you can drill down based on these SQL IDs. So each and every one of these three levels gives you a perspective as to who's consuming the most amount of stuff and who's blocking. And in every one of these, you can switch and you can see a, a different facet of that particular uh, filter that's been applied. What else can you do? You go into SQL monitoring, you can see what SQL ex SQL's executing, you can see the hints it's executing with, you can see all the session information, you can see the CPU weight and all that other sort of stuff. So there's, there's a lot of information here and you can basically see plans, plan executions. Uh, this, is, this is all the normal stuff you would expect to see. So the cool thing is as a DBA, if you're used to doing performance tuning for on-prem databases, this is kind of very similar. Uh, the only difference is that you have all of this built into this autonomous database console, and there's really nothing to set up in this, but you just can use this for your SQLs. And you can identify slow SQLs, you can identify planned stats. Now, an interesting thing here is, now by this one, if I'm looking at activities, it's basically showing me based on resource types. I can switch this, and I can show this by plan line, and it'll show me which ones are the sort group by where the table access folder is happening. So it'll show me over a period of time when the plan execution is happening by the steps in the plan execution, how long each of these steps have taken. So it's a, these are tiny, tiny things, but they're really cool to see how you can visualize most of this information. So as you can see, there's tons of screens. I'm going to leave these screens here because uh, you know this is good for you guys to look at. Another one is a new thing that's been introduced. There's a tab that's added called workload. And this basically identifies spikes and bottlenecks in your, in your particular environment. And this is a new thing that's been introduced as part of Performance Hub. 
You can also download AWR reports. This was not the case before. When you're in your specific compartment, there's a screen like this, which I showed you in the Performance Hub. You can actually pick and select the range. And when the range comes, you can say, I want to download the report for this. And this, this AWR report downloads to your browser. So earlier, we had a lot of DBAs that were saying, hey, look, it's great. I can see all this on my screen, but I want to download the AWR reports and start looking at the events and troubleshooting what's going on. We have an option to download these AWR reports from the Performance Hub as well. This is also new. Everybody knows auto scaling. It's a simple checkbox. What that allows you to do is it allows you to scale up and scale down by 3x. Okay, for and this is a simple option. You don't have to think too much about it. The whole idea behind this is if you're doing some activities that require some kind of a bursted kind of uh, a bursted kind of an allocation for CPUs. Uh, auto scaling allows you to manage that. Now, when it auto scales, it adds. When you're done with your jobs and you're no longer using these CPUs, it contracts, it goes back. So it's automatically doing this depending on how much amount of load that you're actually running on your systems. This is really good for data warehousing based applications when you're doing month end reporting or you're running machine learning models and you don't want to impact other people. Or suddenly there's an increase in concurrent usage, somebody wants sales reports or ad hoc queries coming. This is for data warehousing, where this is useful. For OLTP, it's the same thing. Where month-end transactions come in, ad hoc jobs happen, any unexpected peak in operations can happen, and this is what is required to not impact users. And this integrates very well with the CPU IO shares feature. A simple option, just checkbox and you're done. And it takes care of adding the CPUs and pulling the CPUs back down based on the load that's running on your systems. Let's go into something different. Loading data in a DBMS cloud. Now, it, this is, it, a lot of people know about this, but I tried to summarize a couple of most common options that you have. So first of all, to load this, you have to use this DBMS cloud copy data. But before you do this, you use DBMS cloud create credentials, where you specify and you store these credentials within the system. It, and this system, this, this basically stores it within your department. Once you do this, there are a couple of different ways to load data. The first one is the most simple one, and we've seen this before, where I just create something on the object store, and I specify that this is a text file, and just load this with a comma delimited value. I create a table called channels, and I just load this using DBMS Cloud copy data. The second example is an example for copying an export dump file, a data pump export dump file. So I have an, I have an export dump of an on-prem database that I want to load into the, into the autonomous database, and I copy this to my object store. Once I copy this to my object store, I specify this DBMS cloud copy data, and I specify this link to the dump file. And if you notice, I'm specifying the format as value data pump. So it knows it's a data pump file, and it's going to load this as a data pump file and load it into the table name called channels. So this is the second example of how you can use data pump to load data into, into the autonomous database. The third example goes into a JSON file, a simple JSON file, where I specify the record delimiter value as slash n, and I specify this as a JSON object. So this is simple, it's a JSON file, load the JSON file, the collection name is fruit, and I've specified what the default credentials are and the, where the file is located. So this is how you locate a simple JSON file. Now I have an array of, of, uh, an array of uh, documents that is in this fruit array.json file, but it's an array. Now, how do I prevent it from loading as an array? Instead, I unpack it, and each of these entries within this JSON file is loaded as a separate document into this collection. So for that, I specify two things. The first thing I do is I specify the record delimiter. The record delimiter 0x01 is kind of this value that doesn't appear in this JSON document. So when I specify a record delimiter that does not exist in this JSON document, it will use this unpacked arrays value to break down an array, and each entry of the array basically becomes a separate, uh, what do you call, document, and it loads it properly into this collection. So the purpose of the second command is to take a JSON document, take a JSON array, break down each entry of the array into a JSON document, specify a record delimiter 0x01 because this character does not exist in that particular JSON document and specify unpack arrays so that it's not loaded as an array, 
but it's loaded up as a series of documents into this particular collection. So these are a couple of examples of how you can load data using DBMS Cloud, either copy file or copy collection. These are, these are different methods. Then once I've loaded my stuff, I want to see what happened to it. Did it succeed? Did it fail? There's a view called user load operations or a table called user load operations where you can query and you can see whether it succeeded, it failed. And you can, ease, you can also query each of these to find out if it succeeded, if it failed, what happened to it. You can also see the creden what credentials have you saved. Remember, it does not reveal the credential details, but it tells you what default credentials have you created as part of your credentials. When you select credential name, username from all credentials. So what did this cover? I create credentials. I can create objects for bucket links. I can transfer files to them. I can load text files. I can load uh, object files. I can load uh, like data pump dump files. I can also load parquet files, ORC files. There's a whole bunch of array of documents that are added and supported in the most recent version that came out in uh, in June. Uh, there was a there was a newsletter sent out where you can also load parquet files into this. So this covers the all the different ways that you can transfer data into this. The last aspect, which is obviously my favorite, is how to basically get started with Oracle machine learning inside the, inside the autonomous database. Now, by default, there are all of these categories for machine learning. There's uh, attribute importance for trying to figure out what are the most important elements or inputs to your algorithm so that the predictions can be more accurate. There's classification, which allows you to predict customer behavior you can also target people if you're like if it's like it's like you buy something you can buy this thing or if this person has had this ice cream then they might like this ice cream there's so many different activities that you can schedule with classification anything to do with numbers is regression uh, i'm trying to predict stock market activity i'm trying to predict fraud all of these things are regression activities i've explained this many times in my past sessions but what i've tried to do is i try to put all of them together with examples of all of these activities so Anomaly detection, associations, these are all different methods of machine learning. By the way, again, if I see people raising hands, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. We will try to cover as many questions as we can when we finish this presentation. All right. The next one. Uh, so the, the goal is to basically add the data scientist role to your current DBA role where you understand the business, you try to understand what data preparation is. So most of the parts out here from data understanding, data preparation and modeling are already part of your current job. If you're building uh, data marts, if you're building data lakes, and you're trying to like basically create facts, dimensions, data warehouses, you're already doing this. The interesting part is the evaluation and deployment where you actually use machine learning. So by default, you go to the service console, now, you know, these screens keep changing. This is an older version of the screen, but these screens keep changing. But the basic options remain the same. When you go to the service console, you log in to your autonomous database account. There's an option called manage ML users. When you go to manage ML users, you can see the ML users that you have created. Now, these are not the DBA users for the database. These are your data scientists that will log into the database and will work on the data that's present inside the database. They cannot change, they cannot influence uh, the source of the data. They'll be able to do it depending on what credentials you give them. Now here, you create a new user and you send the email to them, to the person, whoever's the data scientist that you want to give these privileges to. And they get an email saying, hey, an account has been created for you, go check this out. When they do this, then they have to sign in. There's a link also that goes and says, this is where you sign in. They create their own credentials and they sign in and they basically get access to run SQLs, to create uh, notebooks, to basically see the template galleries. What are the examples of notebooks that these people can create? Now, here's an example of a statistical function that's been written, in this case, to compare average purchase amounts between men versus women and it's grouped by income level. Now, a very common method in statistics is basically called t-test where if you do this thing, it's called the two-sided p-value. If the value is less than 0.05, it shows significant differences in the amounts purchased between men and women for this particular example. The function here is called stats t test in depth u, and that's how I'm calculating the observed statistics as well as the two-sided p-values for this. Here's a good example of a simple statistical function 
that can be used to compare average purchase amounts for men versus women group by income category. The same thing can be done for attribute importance. So these are just examples of simple SQL that I can write to, I'm trying to create a model, but before I use this, I wanna find out which are the most important attributes when I'm trying to create a model for insurance I want that I wanna use as part of my training. So according to attribute importance and according to the table settings I've specified, it says bank funds and, and the monthly overdraw on your bank accounts are the two most important things that you have to consider before you sell somebody insurance. And of course, you can see the attribute names and their ranks as compared to how important these things are when you are trying to sell something to somebody. So this is a method for trying to figure out the input attributes and how important these attributes are vis-a-vis -vis when you're trying to build a machine learning model. Simple pieces of SQL that you can use. Inside this, there's a whole bunch of templates. Now remember this, machine learning does not always have to be using machine learning algorithms. You can just use the visualizations. You can just break things. You can use stacked bar graphs. You can compare different classification models based on the different algorithms that are used. But as, you know, as a data scientist about three years ago when I was playing with some of this stuff, everything was manual. I had to build the data. I had to take the test and training data. I have to you know, split this data and try to figure out, do, a, do something called a cross-fold validation when I'm trying to determine if my test and training data set is good or not. Uh, do I have variations in my data set? Am I, oh, am I underfitting or overfitting my model? So a lot of people I used to explain, people are like, I don't understand any of this. So why do I have to do this? All I know is this is the data. This is what I want. Why can't I just train it? And you figure out which algorithm is important to use for this. So now we have, by default, what we have now is SQL. It's called OML for SQL. We're coming out with something called OML for Pi that's going to allow us to use uh, Python as a front-end interface to be able to execute things against the backend that's actually sitting in Oracle. So data frames are exposed using something called uh, transparency proxy objects. So, by the way, these are the example templates within the autonomous uh, data, data warehouse cloud service. Uh, but when you're, talk when you're talking about OML for Pi or OML for R, we have a data frame proxy object. So the data remains in the database server. So one of the biggest things with the, uh, whenever I've had a chance to work on all these models is that every time you're building something, you have, uh, you have to move the data out of the database and bring it in some text file and you load it here and you do something and you move it back to the database or you move something out of uh, HDFS and you do something and you move it back to a database. There's all this movement happening, right? And one of the biggest problems in machine learning is you have to constantly keep moving this data back and forth. Uh, we've decided that that's not a good idea. So this is something that's coming soon where we're gonna have proxy objects. So you can create a pandas data frame or it will look and behave like a Pandas data frame, but it will have access to all the data that's actually present in the backend database tables. You can overload all these native functions. They basically translate to SQL, but I don't know a single line of SQL, but I can still use most of this. You have this familiar Python syntax that you can use to manipulate database data. Uh, we also have another service called a data science service that allows you to run things on generic libraries like TensorFlow, uh, scikit-learn, and all this. That is different from the Oracle machine learning libraries present in the autonomous database. That is more tightly coupled with the database, whereas the data science cloud service is a generic cloud service with all the open source libraries that are available as part of that. That also connects to the autonomous database separately, but this one is more tightly embedded within the autonomous database. It allows you to take parallelization to a new level because it uses PQ in the database to basically scale and automatically uh, expose all these in-database algorithms to the external Python or R processes that are actually connecting to a database servers. Now, you won't see any of these external processes because they're all going to be using uh, XProc internally within the database servers, but you will just be seeing a notebook. And it allow you to, to invoke R Python notebook scripts directly when you're operating on the autonomous database. Now, the most interesting thing is this one, is for people that are not data scientists and just hate this process of trying to identify algorithms and trying to do these kind of things, we're coming up with this thing called AutoML. And AutoML is gonna do two things for us. One, it's going to significantly reduce the number of features. So it's going to auto-feature auto selection 
by using attribute importance and all other methods to improve your accuracy. And it's also going to pick the algorithm and the hyperparameters for those algorithms automatically. And it will run these combinations and give you the best model. So as, as a DBA, you don't have to do too much. You can use AutoML to train your models and you can use the best model on top of your data and expose it in the form of an Apex report. So this is really easy to use and you don't have to understand how machine learning works in order to leverage all of this. So this is also something that is coming with the OML for Pi. An interesting thing is this is, and this is what kind of the user interface sort of looks like. So I'm loading this data. You can see the histogram and the importance have already been pre-calculated as part of this. So it's already using ML under the covers. It's already figured out how to expose some of these interesting things to you. And it's already running a random forest, generalized linear model, as well as naive Bayesian. It's queued. So you can see in the progress thing on the right side, those are the combinations of algorithms that are running on your data to figure out what, in this case, I'm trying to basically identify who I can sell insurance to. So that's an automatic use case where I'm not doing anything. I just give it the data and say, you figure out which model works the best. Biggest advantage of this, minimal user input. I just need to give the data and say, what is, what, what is the output label I want to predict? All the models are built in a unified fashion. You can track the models, you can track the entire life cycle of the model. Uh, if you ran something last week that worked, and if you're trying to find something this week that didn't work and you want to go back to the previous model, you can easily do that. You don't need to know machine learning to leverage this. This is a tool. As a DBA, you can use these tools without knowing what random forest is. You just know it's another algorithm that helps you do interesting things. And it significantly improves data scientist productivity. It allows you to monitor your models. You can deploy this. You can look at a model leaderboard. So if I have multiple models that you're training for multiple use cases, you can find out what are the best models for today across all your use cases. There's a whole bunch of stuff. This, is, this significantly changes the game when it comes to uh, you know, using machine learning for DBAs on top of the autonomous cloud without actually understanding how the internals work. So I've been waiting for this feature. This is actually a really cool feature, and this completely opens it up for a whole bunch of other people. Uh, I always have this screen because it, and something always keeps getting added to it because this is the entire suite of algorithms that this thing supports. The last aspect I want to talk about is now it also supports SQL access to tenancy details. A lot of times when you're raising SRs, people will ask you, what is a tenancy detail? Sometimes we have it automatically, but now you know there's a way you can say select cloud identity from V$ PDBs and it will actually expose the database name with the OSID, the compartment OSID, and all the details for your tenancy that can actually help you troubleshoot this. With that, questions? Hang on, I'm just going to stop sharing so I can see the chat, the chat screen. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna scroll um, back. Uh, uh, Sandesh? So yeah. this, you can check out the uh, Q&A panel. Uh, all the questions yeah. are there. OK. Give me a second. OK, so first question, uh, what is the meaning of always free? Is there any time frame for this? Always free means exactly always free. Now, uh, they haven't given a time frame, but the way I look at it is it is going to stay that way. Uh, once you have an account, they don't charge you for that account until you choose to upgrade that account. For paid. Uh, in the free option for only credit card, is there an easy way to get free here? The credit card is necessary to know that you are who you are. There is no cloud service that will not allow, that will allow you to create an account without a credit card. Now, I know sometimes what we do is we do these events where you don't need the credit card, but you know, any, any cloud provider today that allows you to create a free account requires a credit card. Basically, otherwise, people can create thousands of bogus accounts, and uh, that's that's not that's not helpful. Can we fix the plan in the autonomous database via SPM and SQL profile? No, not yet. There is a discussion currently on this uh, where uh, we're going to allow to do this. See, the thing is, no. Remember this: the whole the whole idea behind this is that we're trying to make this simpler and not trying to make this more complicated. So. Ideally, the plan should not be wrong in the first place because everything tries to use lesser indexing and kind of uses more of the uh, more of the push down to the cells 
So we force full table scans for the, when you're doing things on the cells because cells are way more faster than doing index lookup scans for most queries. But uh, they, you know, I've heard of discussions. I don't know whether it's going to happen or not, but uh, right now you can monitor your SQLs. You can decide if a particular user is... Uh, uh, so by the way, there was a long discussion about supporting hints. In the earlier versions, they were, but I wouldn't be surprised if hints were to be allowed sometime soon and hence automatically SQL profiles. A uh, regional wallet is an OCI construct. It's at, at a higher level when you're when you're configuring a, a whole bunch of services as part of your containers. So what I showed you is the database wallet that's not the regional wallet. Uh, after rotation, the old wallet will expire immediately or after some time. The moment you rotate, the old wallet is gone. You can't connect in using the old wallet anymore. So which means you have to plan this. Uh, you So by the way, existing connections continue. Uh, the moment you disconnect, you can't reconnect back again. Uh, also, when you change uh, these stats, uh, you know, there are many, many properties do not apply to sessions that are already connected. So they will continue to doing whatever they're doing, but the moment you attempt a new connection, so you'll have to keep those connections active, swap the wallets, change the locations, and then force a reconnect. That's what you have to do. Then with no access for autonomous database, does this support applications like EBS, ERP, which has a lot of customizations, applications tightly stitched with database? I, you know, most, most people that use uh, autonomous, the, especially the shared autonomous versions, they basically are using custom applications, not EBS and all these things. Because for EBS, we have a Fusion Cloud service, which is a completely separate cloud service for this. See, remember this. The goal of this is to actually give you something that is pre-packaged that's already there and running so that you don't have to do anything. Now, if you have to install ERP, you have to do customizations and a whole bunch of other stuff that you have to do, uh, there are two choices available for you. One is to use the Fusion ERP cloud service. And a second option is you use something like ATP dedicated, where you get your own Exadata in your own environment, or you use XSCC Gen 2, which is Exadata Cloud at customer, which is like the exadatas of the old days, except you rent the machine and you're using the OCI cloud control plane to provision and install and do all these other kinds of things where you have control in the box. You set up the database, you set up the apps instance, you do whatever you want. That allows you in XSCC to get all of this control. If you want to use a standard instance on the cloud, like a true SaaS service, you're going to use the Fusion ERP cloud service, which basically has EBS and all of these things. Is there an option in ADB to grant cell service, uh, cell service option to application owner to manage basic tasks like kill session? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, there's so credential management is not as fine grained as it is uh, when you when you when you have this in uh, in the on prem database. Uh, you know what? So let me Nitin, right? So why don't you just send me a tweet? I can look this up and give you a more detailed answer sometime offline. Uh, let's see this. In ADB, no need of OEM anymore, which has inbuilt monitoring features. Now, remember this. OEM is an entire management suite. It is monitoring. It's just one part of it. Okay? So there is so much of stuff that is there as part of OEM, which is not replicated in autonomous. But at the same time, it's also not needed. Right? So what you need from OEM is the alerting and the monitoring features. Because table space management backups, this, that, all that stuff is taken care of as part of the autonomous database offering. So it's kind of unfair to compare enterprise manager to this. It is the performance monitoring part of enterprise manager, a scaled down version of it, which is available here in this screen, which is more than enough for you to do what you want to do. If you're doing performance tuning, if the person is connected to the wrong service name and is running a query and blocking everybody, all of these things you need to have control to go and detect it. But it's not as full-fledged as OEM, especially if you're using an on-prem environment or an XSCC environment, you still use Enterprise Manager to troubleshoot and manage. Even for other online database cloud services like you know DBCS or uh, uh, what do you call it? ATP Dedicator, you can still use an on-prem Enterprise Manager or OMC, or OMC which is the uh, Oracle uh, Enterprise Managed Cloud, to actually connect and do administration for this. So again, the answer to this is, these are simple monitoring screens. They do not in any way equate to enterprise manager. 
uh, do we have access or read all the active session history or this in the autonomous database? The views that you see in the graphical user interface are basically the same views. Uh, in some cases, you can export some of this information out of the database, but in most cases, you can see this graphically. Uh, we've provided AWR reports. I won't be surprised if you provide ASH reports at some time in the future, but you know, I, I honestly don't have the answer to this. That you, so you have access to the data from this, but you don't have access to the actual views. At least that's, I'm not aware of it. Uh, how is DR and HA ensured for autonomous database? Is this something end user has to explicitly configure? Is it taken care of by service provider? By default, all of these are running on X readers and rack environments. So they, they have enough redundancy across racks. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that aspect. There is a data guard service that's available where you can set up and say, I want data guard across this. But there's also an autonomous data guard service at some point. I know one that's in limited availability right now. And so, so the bottom line is it's taken care of by us and you don't need to do anything about it. So we have multiple rack instances. We can move the PDB to multiple rack instances and each of these are configured in different failure zones, which means, so within, within a particular AD, you can specify multiple failure zones. So the machines are running across different physical racks. So if, a, if you know, there's a hole in the ground in the, in the rack, the entire rack of servers goes into the ground and kind of breaks down. The other nodes of this rack cluster are running in different physical racks. So the chances of something happening is absolutely catastrophic if that were to happen. And we have to fail over to DR. So there's sufficient availability that's present as part of this configuration. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, no need to use for OEM for configuration for alerts, performance related stuff using console. If you're doing alerts and monitoring, you, you just need what is already there. Uh, so in this case, in general, we are creating tuning tasks in ADW. Is it create, I, I don't understand the question, but the way I look at this is by default, we try to configure this using the most optimal parts for execution of the SQL. We have ample bandwidth in the cells. Uh, we have uh, we, we have the ability to push down most of these queries to the cells, and hence full table scans are pretty effective in that. So a lot of stuff usually does not require any tuning tasks. Uh, we've enabled uh, the auto indexing feature for some of the environments, uh, where we can choose to create and drop indexes as we go. But usually the push down for cells works far more effective in anything that you want to do. So we don't create tuning tasks per se, because remember we have thousands and thousands of databases running SQLs and we have no idea what these SQLs are. But what we do is we have the ability to measure these SQLs and see if these SQLs are running across in terms of the workload. And uh, we can move the instances to different machines from an optimal placement standpoint, if that's the case. That's what we use it for. Uh, performance advisors, I don't think any of this applies for you. We use some of this stuff under the covers, but users don't have access to this. What is the snap frequency of the AWR? The standard snap frequency for the AWR, uh, but uh, you can uh, you can actually, I don't know, I don't think you can change this, but uh, you can go and pick this based on the default snap frequency that we have for the AWR, which in this case is hourly. Can I do hang analyze SQL tracing, blah, blah? No. Can I see the alert log? No. Uh, how we charge for auto scaling? Use as you pay. Yes, it is use as you pay. The moment your load drops below, say for example, I'm consuming 100% CPU, it scales up. I drop below 300% CPU, it scales down. Then you know slowly deallocate CPUs. If you go down to like the original, say 70%, it completely drops out. Uh, for free ADB, when are these SQL queries need to run? Able to log into compute compute node, or do I have options to run from the OCI console? So when you go to free ADB. You can run all of these things from either OML notebooks, uh, SQL developer, Apex, SQL modeler. There's so many, there are apps in the browser. There's clients you can connect using the wallets that are available. SQL developer, SQL modeler. There's so many applications that you can use to connect to these. Uh, if you're running on Zeppelin notebooks on OML, you can run the SQL queries there as well. Uh, let me see. There are many questions. I'm gonna to try to pick the smaller ones. And uh, guys, you can tweet me or uh, send me a message on LinkedIn if you if, if I'm not able to get to your questions. I have one more minute before I have to hand it over to Connor. 
So I'm just going to uh, pick a few more. Is it possible to clone my autonomous DB to my on-prem database for this, for non-fraud application testing? There's a clone feature, but we've usually seen the clone feature being used uh, when you're cloning an autonomous database to another autonomous database. Uh, when you're moving on-prem to autonomous, there's something called ZDM. It's called zero, uh, wait, I forgot the name what it stands for, but uh, it's, 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 a, it's a feature that allows you to take on-prem databases and transfer them and create a standby on the cloud and then moves the entire database. And it basically creates this, uh, creates and automates this entire process as it is. So it's called ZDM. Look up ZDM within the Oracle site. Uh, what else is there? We create autonomous database and dedicated. We get to see message, no containers available. Where, where, we, where are we required to create containers? By default, uh, the containers are created and then you have to pick the container that is there. By the way, so when you're using dedicated uh, infrastructure, an XData is dedicatedly provisioned for you. And by default, it contains a single container. And everything you do is inside that container. You can create as many containers as you want after that. You have to use the APIs that are given to you as part of OCI to create additional containers. Please share a strong use case. Show why the ADB dedicated is the best option for database consolidation. You see, you'll use ADB dedicated for cases where you do you want your application to be isolated, you don't want anybody else to share your environments, you have more control on your systems when you're upgrading your databases and everything, except everything is done through a cloud API. So any large complex application, you will basically use dedicated. Shared is good for a lot of tiny applications. You know, you'll be surprised how many applications which have anywhere from uh, you know 10 to 50 terabytes of data can easily be pushed into uh, shared. But shared is still a shared environment and it restricts you and there's a, a certain set of things you would like to do which you want a dedicated environment for. Credit card is no longer required for free. You know, I, I remember this, they take a credit card, they charge you a buck and then they release it. It is just to, sh just to ensure you are who you are and you're not creating fake accounts, but they don't charge you after that. So it's, uh, unless you upgrade to paid, you'll never be charged anything. So you just see a $1, that's a standard thing that most credit card providers do to see if this is a valid credit card or not. Uh, Sai, I think we're done with time, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandesh, uh, for your time and support. And uh, we will try to cover rest of the questions. Uh, let me share something in a few minutes. Um, yeah, as uh, Sandesh mentioned, uh, you can also treat him directly uh, that way you can actually connect to Sandesh and rest of the attendees. And you can see uh, Sandesh uh, R is the Twitter handle. Um, with that, I'm Is it possible, to... Sai, for me to continue typing? I can type the answers in this QA while yes, yes, absolutely. Connor takes yeah. over, right? Okay, yeah, so that's, uh, what, that's what I'll do. Okay, that's fine. And we're also capturing all the questions. So if it is not answered, uh, we will definitely answer that so the plan is to we'll put the separate page on our website with a video and the presentation link and the chart history yeah okay okay so the next slide okay learn and win so attend more sessions and more points what is this all about right so so basically uh, one minute equals to one point and now you have earned 60 points after attending uh, the session and uh also, we have a bonus points on social media activities. Please check your delegates first newsletter for more details. So here you can see four types of recognitions. Uh, the major one is getting an AI OG membership. So we have actually have a, a four types of memberships um, except uh, the free one. Um, so you can check a lot of benefits. Uh, you can go to AIOG page and the join us uh, page. You can find all the benefits. And also you can earn OG Athra badge so that you can share in your LinkedIn, Twitter. Also, uh, we will provide a, a certification of participation. And this is like a real competition. So let's do it. Um, um, continue a conversation in Twitter. This is the only way you can connect people virtually because, uh, you know, as a panelist, we can see there are like how many people attended. Uh, but, you know, if you want to continue network with uh, other people, uh, you can use these hashtags. Um, also, the presentation material will be available after Yatra. Um, you need to access through AIOG portal again. 
Um, we also have a special program, surprise program planned on 4th of July. Um, you know, we normally prefer to do events on Saturdays and days, especially on Saturdays. So do not miss to join. We have keynotes, uh, fireside chat. So some of the questions are not answered here. So you'll be answered in that fireside chat. It's also, we are getting the bunch of experts. It's uh, not only one speaker. So please watch out uh, the program. We will update today or tomorrow. And also we are bringing all the ACES and Java champions from India into one single call to understand their experience and you know their journey to ACE program, ACES or ACE directors. So that's going to be interesting one. And uh, uh, 12th of July, we have a dedicated to Kids Track. Uh, this is one of the popular program part of OG Yatra. We teach means basically there's a other um, other, other friend of mine is teaches uh, robotics. Uh, please watch our website for more details. We will start registrations today. And you can actually bring all your kids on Sunday. Uh, we have actually four slots. And also it is categorized on uh, age category, uh, eight to 10, 10 to 12, and after 14 plus, I think. So we'll publish that today. So please watch out that space. Important thing is speaker feedback, right? So you can scan this code and provide your feedback. Uh, that's that's the only way you can actually thank speaker. So that way, you know, next presentation, he can include what is missing, what is not missing. So please provide. And there's also text box. You can ask questions in that if you're unable to answer now. Let's see, ask now, sorry. So with that, um, so thank you, Sandesh, for your continuous support. Definitely, we are missing all your selfies, all the fun. Um, but uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, webinar. And the next session starts at 11.30. So we have around 30 minutes, like 24 minutes. So we'll catch you again in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thanks all for attending. So I'm still answering some of the questions online. Right here. OK. Should I just continue with the Q&A, Sai, or how does this, if I have some time, I can um, just answer. We this. have to close. Uh, if you want, you can answer next three minutes. Okay. So there's, an, there's a question here saying, is there any options to get the backups of ML notebooks which are created by the user? Yes. By default, you can export all the ML notebooks as JSON documents and uh, whichever, whichever documents that you create. There's ways to share ML notebooks from different platforms. Uh, and you can transfer them to our platform. There's a way to import ML notebooks within the platform. Uh, also, a lot of people have asked the, some of the most common questions. Uh, I've put a link in the chat. Uh, that link basically is an, a link to an FAQ which has you know, answers to a lot of questions. So if you can take a look at that and see if your question is answered there or not. Uh, then what is the difference between dedicated infrastructure versus shared infrastructure deployment in ADB? Uh, the dedicated infrastructure is uh, where you get your own exadata and they create your own containers and stuff like that, and you're not sharing that exadata with anybody else. A shared infrastructure is basically you get a, an exadata with a bunch of rack nodes where you know you could be sharing it with a bunch of people, depending on how many clients they are, how much CPUs they're bought. Uh, you'll all be sitting on the same rack cluster. You'll be partitioned by PDBs. So that's the difference between the two, and obviously there are cost differences because in one case you get a dedicated exadata, in the other case you're sharing someone's exadata. So depending on what app, what kind of application you have, do you have a large application? Do you need isolation? You cannot be sitting on a box with some other user. Uh, you would decide to choose either dedicated or shared infrastructure. Sai, just let me know when I'm done, okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, is there an option to check runaway SQLs? Will it get control through Resource Manager? Will it cancel SQL executions based on config? By default, all the connections are done through uh, three service names. All of these service names are resource manager, resource manager control. So there's no concept of a runaway SQL here unless you connect to the service that basically has the highest priority. So there's uh, there's high, medium, and low, and then there's TP, uh, there's TP and TP urgent. These are the different kinds of services that are available. If you connect to the highest priority service and you have a runaway query, it's going to consume resources and starve the rest. So the best option is for anybody executing ad hoc or runaway SQL, give them the lowest priority service name to connect to. So that way they will never bother the production application, which is basically running at a, a connected to a service, which is basically having the highest priority. Uh, 
let's see what else is there. Currently, we can use rack for load balancing on-prem. Can we emulate the same? Uh, by default, we use rack and we use load balancing. So all this is done for you at the back end. You don't have to do this. By the way, I was thinking ZDM was zero downtime migration, and that allows you to create a standby database and uses Golden Gate to create uh, an active-active configuration when you want to transfer your database. That's typically used when you're doing uh, when you're moving not not to autonomous shared. But when you're moving to like DBCS or a VM or to uh, XSCC or to uh, uh, a or to ATP or ADW dedicated, uh, that's when you will use uh, the ZDM tool, and it basically does the entire end-to-end -end migration. The team behind this has spent a lot of time trying to develop all that automation, so you don't have to do it. So that's definitely something that is worth checking out. Sandesh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, All right, I'll continue typing the answers into the Q&A. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Sandesh. Thanks a lot.